Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Jean-Pierre Aumont in the Marquis de Lafayette on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we tell you the story of the Marquis de Lafayette, the French nobleman who helped America to become a nation, and who, having done so with honor and success, returned to serve France in her own difficult years. The old world, however, proved harder to serve than the new. Indeed, Lafayette spent several years in Britain before he again crossed the Atlantic to receive here the gratitude of all Americans and the signal honor of being the only foreigner whose direct descendants have been granted honorary and perpetual citizenship of the United States. Lafayette, the friend of Washington, was a gallant soldier, a liberal thinker, and a great gentleman. Truly, one of the most exciting and romantic figures in the history of his time. To tell the story of his early life, we have used the thoughtful biography by P.C. Headley. And to star as the Marquis, we are fortunate indeed to have that very fine actor, Jean-Pierre Aumont. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the card you want to send. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it, with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. And now here is the first act of P.C. Headley's The Marquis de Lafayette, starring Jean-Pierre Aumont. tell the story of the Marquis de Lafayette, to measure him against the panorama of history, we must go back further than the birth of our nation, almost 180 years to 1774, when Lafayette was a youth, ardent, gay, chivalrous, full of adventure. Come in. Baron de Cal. Lafayette, the servant said I would find you here. What on earth are you doing? I am choosing a wife. You are what? Her Majesty the Queen suggested to me it's time I choose a wife. What are those parchments? Family histories of the first ladies of France. Just I like... shall choose among them. Just like that from a parchment? Yes. Have you met any of the ladies? Mm, very few. <laughs> Nothing is written here but the history of the family. Do you not want to know the complexion, the face, the form of the lady you intend to honor? This is the safe way to choose a wife. So at least my father often said... And since my mother was a woman of rare beauty and wisdom, I shall choose in the same manner my father chose. Oh, Lafayette, you amaze me. Where's your hot Gallic blood? Go find a face that pleases you. Love should come with uh, abandon and recklessness. I have chosen, my lady. Have you indeed? Mm -hmm. And who is the favored one? My lady is the Countess Anastasie de Noailles, daughter of the Duke Dayen. Indeed. And have you ever seen her? No. But her background is irreproachable. Well, I have met this lady. Have you? What is she like? Oh, no, you don't. You have chosen from a parchment. Look to the parchment for your information. I shall do better than that. I shall present myself to the lady. And so, at last, I stood in the presence of Anastasia. I have come to offer myself as a husband. 
She smiled, and I was her slave. I had come to conquer. She spoke, and I was conquered. I had seen beauty, but none such as hers. I was by her side constantly in the weeks that followed. You are different from any man I have ever known. Sometimes I look at you and I think to myself, why is he different? Is it because of that fiery red hair? And then I think, no, I have known others with the same hair, others with the same color eyes, the same grace, the same charm. What is it? And I can only come to the conclusion that the thing that makes you different, the thing that draws me to you, is the very thing that frightens me about you. Frightens you? How do I frighten you? You frighten me when you speak of war. <laughs> I am a soldier. Yes, you are a soldier. You frighten me too when you speak of America. But don't you realize what's going on over there? Men are fighting for liberty, equality, for freedom for themselves and all who follow after them. You are a nobleman. Are you not free? Yes, I am free. But I want freedom for all men. And if this fight is won in America, it's a major victory not just for the men in that country, but for all men everywhere. You'd like to join that fight, wouldn't you? Anyone with a dream of freedom would be on fire to join that fight, wouldn't they, Anastasia? There are my fears, given voice and name, freedom, America. But why should you fear them? Because I am a woman and in love with a man who would leave me for them. In love, Anastasia? Yes, my darling. In love. We were married in April of the year 1774, the most fortunate year of my life. We did not talk again about America, but the world was always there, unspoken but not forgotten. In 1776, I was an officer in the French army, stationed at Metz, and I read the American Declaration of Independence. Once more, I was on fire to join them. I resigned my commission in the army, I returned to Paris, and with my friend, Baron de Kalb, I called on one of the American agents in Paris, Mr. Silas Dean. Gentlemen, you must appreciate the fact that this war is very serious to us. It's not the colorful, exciting engagement that many of the young soldiers of fortune over here seem to think it. We are not interested in your fight because we think of it as an adventure, I think. No, we are interested in your cause. Why? Why should you be? Because a major blow is being struck for liberty. If it is one in America, I believe it will catch fire and spread to other countries. A man must fight for his beliefs if he can find his battleground. And I believe my battleground is your country. I ask nothing from you except permission to fight on your behalf. And that is all I ask. I am sure that no American could possibly deny you after hearing your views. I will give you a letter to my government, but I can furnish you with very little else. I will provision a ship myself and sail as soon as possible. It is only fair to tell you that the tide of battle is against us at the present. We see little hope of victory at the moment. The tide will change, Mr. Dean. When men fight for liberty, they fight with a purpose and strength than can change the tides of victory and history. Do you think your king will permit you to leave France? I do not intend to ask permission. I will make my preparations quietly in the greatest secrecy. You give me the letter to your government. I'll do the rest. I will prepare it at once. And so, Baron de Kalb and I began our preparations. I had a ship purchased, stocked with supplies. By March of 1777, all was in readiness. And then, and only then, I told my anesthesi. You are going to America? Yes. I wish I could find the words to tell you why this must be, why I must leave you. I know. I've always known. I did not know when the day would come, but I knew it would come. 
Do you know also that you are my happiness, my life? Yes. I know that too. Just as I know that this cause of yours is more important than happiness or life to you. I shall miss you every moment I'm away. When are you leaving? Before sunrise. <gasps> so soon. You give me very little warning. Forgive me, I thought it would be easier for both of us. Anastasia, you will be asked many questions as soon as my departure is known. You must say you know nothing. The king opposes you. Yes, the king has ordered me elsewhere. He doesn't want to show any sympathy for the American cause just now. I think he suspects. I have been followed every place I go of late. Then how can you get to your ship? I'm going to disguise myself as a courier. I'll get there. Oh, I'm frightened for you. Don't be. Just love me and wait for me. I will be back. God go with you. God keep you. I reached my ship, the Victory, on March 26. Baron de Calb was on board waiting for me. We set sail at once. I received a message just before they left. The king has ordered your arrest. It's too late. We've escaped him. Not quite. He has sent dispatches to the West Indies ordering your arrest there in case you escape in here. Very well. We won't land on the islands. We'll sail directly for the American coast. But we will need water, supplies. I do not think the captain will agree to it. The captain will take his orders from me. And my orders are sail directly for America. We were two long months at sea. Two long months of storm and calm. Our eyes always on the horizon. Always hunting the long-awaited land. And at last, we beheld it. There it is. There it is, Lafayette. America. Sure. The captain says it is the eastern coast of South Carolina. I have dreamed of this land, hunger for it, waited most of my life to reach it. And there, there it is. And now, what is to happen to us? Yes, what awaits us now? What will our reception be? And what will be our fate? Will we fall in battle? Or will we live to see the victory? You will live to see your victory. If ever a man existed with the determination to live to see a victory, that man is you. Look well at that land. Those are the shores of a country that is to belong to a free people. Look well. Those shores are the hope of all mankind. Well, there she is. When do you want to be put ashore? The sooner the better, Captain. We are late already. Just a moment, we will return to the second act of the Marquis de Lafayette, starring Jean Pierremont. Graduation is one of those occasions made more memorable by the well wishes of friends and family. It's one of those occasions for which Hallmark cards are made. You'll find there's a big collection of Hallmark graduation cards now waiting your selection at the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. And when you sign your name and drop the card in the mail or enclose it with your gift, there's a special feeling of pride in knowing that the card you selected so truly represents your feelings. That it says what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And that's the feeling you have when you've selected a Hallmark card. You're sure of its reception, sure of its good taste in design, in paper, in color, in the sentiment it expresses. Sure that it will be a worthy ambassador of your good taste on such an important occasion as graduation. For through the years, the makers of Hallmark cards have had but one thought in mind to give you cards, no matter what the occasion, that you'll be proud to sign with your name. That's why Hallmark on the back has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of the Marquis de Lafayette, starring Jean-Pierre Lamont. The name 
Leonard Lafayette is in all our history books today. Scholars have written about him. He has become a symbol of the lasting friendship of two worlds. And the nation he befriended has become great and powerful. But in the days of our story, America herself was young. And it was a youth who came to her then, who saw her future, shared her dreams, and helped her fulfill them. It was late July of 1777 as Baron de Kalb and I made our way to Philadelphia, where Congress was in session. Philadelphia. A city sprawling like a child in the wilderness. Finally, I stood before the greatest man of the age, perhaps of any age, the commander-in-chief of the armies of the United States, General George Washington. Come, take a turn with me in the garden. A pleasure, sir. I was delighted to learn you were to be a guest at tonight's dinner. I've been most anxious to meet you. And I to meet you. You have shown great sympathy for our cause. I'm well aware of the risks you ran and the sacrifices you made to get to this country. May I tell you it is moving and gratifying to find such friends as you. May I tell you, sir, that it's moving and gratifying to find there are men fighting for a cause so close to my own heart. Mm. While you are with us, I want you to make my headquarters your home. My family, your family. Sir. I welcome you to my country as a friend. And to my house as a son. My dear Anastasie, how long the weary months since I've held you in my arms. I write you from another world, a world of heat, gunfire, and agonized patriotism. We have just concluded the engagement of Brandywine, a defeat, but I am sure a defeat before victory. And now, I must give you your lesson as wife of an American general officer. They will say to you, they have been beaten. You must answer, that is true. But when two armies of equal number meet in the field, all soldiers have naturally the advantage over new ones. And furthermore, more of the enemy fell in battle than the Americans. Then they will say, all this is very well, but Philadelphia is taken. The capital of America, the rampart of liberty. You must politely answer, you are all great fools. Philadelphia is exposed on every side. A harbor was already closed. But this is the city which we will sooner or later make them yield back to us. If they continue to persecute you with questions, you may send them about their business. I, I have sustained a wound, but nothing serious. I am already well on the way to recovery. I shall meet again tomorrow with General Washington at Valley Forge. My dear husband, no word from you this long, endless winter. My heart despairs. The city is full of rumors that the American forces have been defeated and that you and General Washington both have fallen in battle. And yet, I keep writing because my faith, all my hopes, I know not which, will not let me accept this tidings. You live. You must live. Supplies were low. The men were ill-clad against the cold. Over and over, it seemed as though the cause must be lost. And yet, somehow, the cause and the hope survived the winter, survived the spring, arrived at the summer. And then came the news that France had decided to send aid to America. A naval force would soon be on its way from Toulon. And with joy in our hearts, we watched the enemy evacuate Philadelphia. Now the possibility of victory was at hand. A victory for the American cause and for the cause of all men. Yet, even in the hour of rejoicing, came serious news for me. What is it, my friend? 
You seem troubled. I must ask your indulgence, sir. I have received word that my country is on the verge of war and I am needed at home. I see. I shall be sorry to lose you. But your first duty is to your own country, of course. You wish to be relieved of your command. I would prefer a leave of absence. Then you intend to return? If God so wills. I will write a letter to the Congress at once recommending that you be granted a leave of absence. Thank you, sir. I will miss you. You will always be as a son to me. You have been the father I lost in youth. You have risked your life over and over again. You have been wounded in this country's service. Whatever freedom is won is owed in part to you. You have asked nothing of us. The only thing I want is the friendship of this country and your friendship. That you have had and will always have. I hope someday we can repay the debt we owe you. And if not in our lifetime, that someday some American has the opportunity to repay France for your service. I sailed for France in February 1779. It was almost two years since I had left my wife. I was not yet 22, and the ship that was turned towards home and love seemed unbearably slow. The weeks at sea seemed far longer than all the months in America put together. But at last, I reached Versailles. At last, Anastasia was in my arms again. even more beautiful than I remember. Oh, I've missed you. Longed for you. You're home. Thank God you are safe at home. At last. And so my first adventure in America came to a close. But I knew, as I turned my mind and sword to our problems at home, that I would return. For I felt that I owned a share of that freedom that was won over there. And I wanted to remain close to that country as long as I lived. Then, one day, Anastasia held my new son in her arms. I looked at him, and my heart was filled with the happiness and hope that the future might hold. He's a beautiful baby, isn't he, darling? Yes, Anastasia, yes. And he too must grow to know the meaning of freedom. To merit the friendship of the country that fought for and won its liberty. I would like someday to walk with my son into that beautiful house at Mount Vernon. And to say to George Washington, may I present a citizen of France who has the honor to bear your name. Master George Washington Lafayette. What would he say to that? He would put out his hand and say, Welcome, Master Lafayette. And then our son would say, How can I serve you? Yes, how can I serve you? I know he will keep those words in his heart and say them to any man who fights for freedom and liberty. For all men must be free. And though it takes centuries... In time, all men will be. My darling, you are so sure. How can you know that? I can know it because I went to America. Because I saw men fight wilderness, pestilence, hunger, cold. I saw them fight bullet and bomb against overwhelming odds. I saw them refuse to acknowledge defeat and at last turn defeat into victory. I believe the first great victory for all mankind was won in America. I am proud I could share in that victory. And grateful to live in the century of George Washington. And to see the beginning of the free United States of America.
off your amount, and James Hilton will return in a moment. During these next few weeks, you will probably be seeing a lot of wedding gifts, probably be sending some yourself, maybe receiving some. So I thought you'd like to be reminded tonight of two pieces of news I heard today concerning weddings. First, the new collection of Hallmark wedding cards is now at all the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. Second is that more and more people are enclosing a card, a card with a message inside their wedding gifts. The reason, my wife tells me, is that the gift is a symbol of your wish for their happiness. The card is the actual expression of that wish. For as she says, how are they to know unless you put it into words? And putting wishes for happiness, as well as all other kind thoughts, into words has long been the business of the makers of Hallmark cards. They know the power of words, the warm, sincere words that express true feeling. That's why you can always find a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. Whether for weddings or birthdays or anniversaries or for any occasion you want to remember your friends. That's why, too, along with other reasons, such as fine paper and beautiful designs, that hallmark on the back of a card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you for being with us on the Hallmark Playhouse tonight, Jean-Pierre. You certainly gave us a fine interpretation of a great Frenchman. It was an honor to play in his story, Mr. Hilton. All of us in France are very happy there's been such a long-standing friendship between our two countries. From the days of Lafayette right on to the present. And having people like you over here, Jean-Pierre, will certainly strengthen those ties. Thank you very much. And we know it will continue. Anything that helps friendship grow between countries is most essential. And I think it's important between individuals, too. Even in their everyday relationship. That's why I think that your hallmark cards are so good. They make it easier for all of us to be more thoughtful of other people, to be better friends. You have paid us a very fine compliment, Jean-Pierre. I'm sure the makers of Hallmark cards appreciate it as much as I do. Thank you indeed. And now here's Frank Goss to tell you about next week's story. Next week we shall dramatize the life of one of the somewhat forgotten heroines in American history, Marcia Burns, based on a biography by Virginia Tatnell Peacock. And our star will be that delightful actress, Barbara Stanwyck. Once again, here is James Hilton. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Jean-Pierre Amont may soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Technicolor production, Lily, co-starring Leslie Caron and Mel Ferrer. The role of Anastasia was played by Virginia Gregg. Ted DeCorsia played Baron de Cobb. Raymond Burr was George Washington, and Ted Osborne was Mr. Dean. Every Sunday afternoon on television, Hallmark Cards presents Sarah Churchill, who brings you the story of interesting people on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is Frank Goss, saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Barbara Stanwyck in Virginia Tatnell Peacock's Marsha Burns. And the week after that, Donald Colross Peaty's Forward the Nation, starring Van Heflin on the Hallmark Playhouse. Stay tuned for Mr. Chameleon, which will be heard over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.